Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf Babakama Daf Mem Tes. We are holding at the Mishnah, Mem Ches Amad four lines off the bottom of the Yomit. Shorish Shahayim is Kavin Lechaber. We have a bull aiming to attack uh, his uh, fellow bull. Vihika Saisha and inadvertently he struck a pregnant woman, Vyatsu Yoladea, who now lost her unborn children. Potter midbay Velada is no concept of the Shoyer owner paying the May Veladis compensation specifically for those unborn children because th- that type of payment is specific for a person who attacks an Isha. The Adam Shay Muskam Nachaber for a person was trying to strike his friend and by mistake Vihika Sa Isha Yatsu Yoladea and he struck the woman. And harmed her unborn. In this case, Mishalad Mevelados, he has to pay this the Mevelados payment, which the Gemara will explain. And Rashi points out the same halacha would apply if he specifically targeted the, the Isha herself. Right? But, you know, the Mishnah cites this type of example where he was aiming for one person and inadvertently struck the Isha because the Pasuk describes the incident. In such a manner, two people fighting with each other, and by mistake, one of them hit the isha. So, because on account of the of the pasuk, that's why the Mishnah presented in this fashion as well. A shor accidentally struck an isha, or a man did. Now, Ketzat Mishal Mevelodis. We speak about this the Mevelodis compensation. How exactly do you assess it? The answer is like this: Shaman is a isha, Kama hi yafa, Achila yolda. We, we picture a story like this. We have an Isha who was now harmed. Her unborn were killed. So we, we evaluate, we, we appraise as though this Isha would have been sold as a, a, sl- a maidservant on the market. So her, in terms of her market value, how much did her value drop because of this incident? How much was she worth before she gave birth? How much would a person be willing to spend on a maidservant who has potential to bear children who are going to be his slaves? So there's a greater value there. As opposed to how much she's worth after post-childbirth where there's no potential for you know children of other. So that's the amount. That difference is what he has to pay. That's the actual that the attacker has to pay. If anything, if you're going to work with you know this type of approach, if anything, she goes up in value because now she's not in danger. Something which uh, an Isha who is, you know, awaiting childbirth is in a state of risk due to her, you know, the childbirth experience. So in Cain, Misha Isha ye let this mashpachas. If anything, once she gives birth and she's healthy and strong, if anything, her value goes up. So the, the attacker shouldn't pay anything. Ella rather according to his opinion we, we don't look at the we don't evaluate the you know the actual market value of the, of the woman herself because in terms of her value it actually increased due to this incident rather we focus on the unborn vladis themselves suppose a person would purchase unborn you know uh, children being being uh, you know born as a vodim. So he, he sort of acquires the rights to those unborn children. How much is that worth? So that value is what he hurt, is what he damaged, what he took away. Venice and Laban, that much he gives to the to the father of these children. Okay, so according to Tanakama, it's uh, reckoned in terms of loss of value of the woman herself. According to Ramashim Gamliel, no, specifically the Vladis, because in terms of the Isha, if anything, it goes the other way, her price rises. Let's say she has no husband. You know, he passed away, so the Dmei uh, Veladis gets passed on to his uh, children. Let's say this Isha was a freed maidservant. So basically, she, she had a husband, you know, the same same status. So basically, when he died, there's no family to be Yerish. Or she was a convert married to a Ger, which Rashi says is typical, you know, you marry, you know, your kind. But the main point here is that the man 
was not a, a native, you know, uh, Yid, he was a Evan Meshuchra, who has no Jewish family, or Ger, and all these, we say Potter, the attacker is exempt because there's no one to pay, no one to pay the um, the Meveladis to. So the Mishnah began with a Shur who was targeting his fellow Shur, and by mistake struck the Isha, there's no Dmei Velodis, because the Shur doesn't pay Dmei Velodis. But it would seem from the Mishnah, Tama, the reason is the Meskav and the Chaberi, because he aimed uh, at, his, at his fellow Shur, and not at the Isha. That's why he's exempt. Ha, Meskav and the Isha, but if he would have specifically targeted the Isha and hurt her unborn children, Mishal Dmei Velodis, the owner has to pay that uh, Dmei Velodis? Really? It would appear to be inconsistent with Ravada Bar Ava who tells us in all cases a share is exempt from these payments. The Amar Bar Ava Shvarim Shnis Kavan Isha, even if a share specifically targeted the Isha, Turim Nevelodis. It's not Nevelodis by animals. Amalach Ravada Bar Ava. So he'll respond like this: Who are then the same exact? Precept would apply that Philo and his governor the Isha now Turim if the Shur specifically targeted the Isha, there's no Dmei Veladis. Turim with Dmei Veladis. For all the Tony Shur, Shem is coming to So why does the Mishnah present it in such a manner that he was aiming at somebody else? I did the Kabbalah and the Mishnah is safe on account of the next part of the Mishnah where we discuss a man attacking the woman. Adam is Shahim is coming to Chaveru. He was aiming at his friend and by mistake struck the Isha. Why do we present like this? Because that's how the Pasuk describes it. The Hachik Sif Kro. So because of that story, we begin the Mishnah in this fashion as well, although it's not really a factor to reckon with. Ketani Reisha, Nami Shoshem, Miskam Lechaber, and that's why, you know, we cite that example, but of course, even if the Shur specifically targeted the Isha, there's no Dmei Velodes by a Shur who attacks, but there's one exception. Amra Papa, Shur Shanoge Chasa Shifcha. Oh, here we have a Shur attacking, but not a regular Israelis, a maidservant. Viyotzi Oladeh, and he hurts the unborn children. Mishal Dmei Velodes, here we do pay Dmei Velodes. You know why? Because... We don't look at them like, um, like, like, like the animal attacked a person. We looked at we look at it like he attacked somebody's property. It was property damage because the ever the shifcha these are a person's possessions. My time is so why chamarta ma'barta ba'omo. It's like a, a a pregnant donkey who the azik is what he harmed. Don't cross the pasuk in relating what Avram Avinu told. Um, Ishmael and Eliezer, Shvulochem Poyma Chamar, go sit here with the Chamar. Am Hadoim El Chamar, he was hinting that Eliezer was an Evid, has the same status as donkey, he's my possession, my property. So when a Shur attacks a, a regular Israel, there's no Neve Lodis, but when he attacks you know, anyone's property, including a Shifcha and her Vlodis, you have to pay to compensate for the Neve Lodis. Okay, how is this assessed? Ketat Mishal Neve Lodis. Asks the Gemara, why are we just focusing on the on the value of the unborn children themselves? There's another element as well. There's another component of loss. Aside from the value of the actual unborn children, should a person decide to buy them, there's market value for that itself. But you know, the mother herself, if she was a maidservant, she looks plumpier and healthier and you know more pronounced when she's pregnant. So that would also fetch a higher price on the market. Ushvach Veladis Mibayla is also increased in value in terms of the Isha herself because she's in, in this pregnant state if she were to be a maidservant. So bottom line is there are really two components of, of responsibility, liability. There's the actual value of the Vladis and the Shvach and the Isha reflective of her pregnant state. So why doesn't the Mishnah you know, mention that as well? Actually, the Mishnah does. Okay, so Mishal Dmei How do you go about paying this compensation? U Shabach Veladis and Shabach Veladis as well. So Mishnah meant to include both together in the same, you know, phrase. Of course, there are two components. And how do we do that? Shaman Esa Isha Kamei Yafa Ach La Yoda V'Kamei Yafa Mishyoda Meaning, how do we evaluate the second component? The Shabach of the Isha because of her Vlad so, meaning the Dmei Veladis per se, that's pretty clear. How much would a person pay for the, you know, uh, unborn Evid that will belong to him? But the mission is basically focusing on the second component. What about the Yishmach and the Isha, reflective of her pregnant state? That's what the mission is actually coming to explain. How do we do that? We evaluate how much would the Isha be worth if she was in a Muberes state? And how much did her value drop because of this incident? That's the Tanakam, who maintains that her value drops. But Amar Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel Imkain Misha Isha Yoladis Mashbachas. 
If so, when she gives birth, she goes up in value. What do you mean, Michael? What do you mean to say? Tanakhama just said he, she drops in value. I'm a rabbi. He came. He meant to say like this. He meant to disagree. Do you mean to say that an isha is worth more before she gives birth than after? Just the opposite. Beforehand, she's in danger. She's at risk. Everything is worth more now than before. So I disagree with this whole idea. There's no second component to speak of. There's no added value to the isha herself. If anything, she looked. She gained. She increased in value after the incident. Rather, all we have is that first component, the actual value of the Vlades. Okay, that's fair. That he has to pay to the, to the husband. Tanya Mihachu, we have the same in a brainstorm. Where we find that according to Rav Shumam Lil, in fact, this was his argument, You mean she's worth more before than after? It's the opposite. Elo, I disagree with that second component. You only pay strictly for the value of the Vlades. So that's Rabba's approach. According to Rav Shumam Lil, we don't discuss that second component. There's no loss there. Rava Amar, he disagrees. Hachik Tani, Ramashunam Lil, meant to say like this. Of course, there are both components. There is the Mei the value of the actual unborn child, and then there is the Shvach Valadis, the added value to the Isha because of her state. But he meant to say like this. Hachik Tani, Vechi Isha, La Misha, Yeladis, Mashbachas. I understand that the Mei Valadis, that first component, that first element of payment, that goes to the Bali Isha, as the Pasuk says, it goes to the husband. But in terms of the, the shvach, which is inherent in the Isha herself, why does it go to the Lemisha led this mashvach to the to the father of the children? Why only to him? She doesn't get anything? It's a joint effort. It's really um, you know it's an element within the Isha herself. I understand it's the, the Vlad that's causing her to look, you know, healthy and big, but ultimately she's also sort of contributing to that. It's like that, you know, the Gemara we had the other day with the nafcha, right? The animal was pregnant, that we say the plumpiness, the, the you know, the um, healthy looking, you know, the, 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 uh, the added, um, you know, the, the fact that the animal appears healthier and bigger, that really belongs to, the, to both, to the animal owner and to the fetus owner. So, same thing over here. Why does that go totally to the husband? Ella... On this, he's coming to disagree, and he's saying like this, So he split the two components. In terms of the actual Dmei Vladis, okay, that's fair and square to the husband. But in terms of component number two, Ushvach Vladis, that's split evenly between him and her chilk. Tanya Mihachu, we have the same in a price, so that in fact, that is, that's his opinion. She doesn't get anything. Of that second, you know, payment. No, Rather, we sort of um, break down this whole incident and its liabilities into four parts. Okay, number one is Nezek. Suppose she wasn't Muber; she was just a regular woman. She was harmed. She's now in bed. She she she's lost value. She came right. Her market value dropped. That's direct Nezek to the Isha, irrespective of her pregnancy state. Okay, so that's. Assessed separately, and also What about her pain and her right? That's also assessed separately. Another liability. Then come the other two components of dmei Velodis. Number one, v'shamenas avelodis, the loss of her unborn children. That goes to the husband, strictly to the husband. But when it comes to that second added element of shvach Velodis, we split it even evenly between him and her chalk. But the question now is, didn't we have a brisa? Before Rava brought the right, that it, it appeared that according to Ramashim Leel, there is no Shvach Vladis at all. If anything, the opposite. After childbirth, she's worth more, she's out of Sakana. And here, Ramashim Leel himself seems to concede that she, she went down in value because of this incident and not up. So we have a steer of Kashya to Ramashim Bengam Leel. Ah, the Ramshim Lil. We seem to have a steer within Ramshim himself. Whether her value goes up or down due to this incident. Like Kasha answers like this. Depends what child. Depends what number it is. Khan Bimavak Keras. She's a 
giving birth to the, you know, Bukhar basically is her firstborn. So as she says, she's really misokenes, in a precarious state, because she hadn't yet experienced childbirth. So here, according to Shimon Gamliel, the, the pre-birth state, the pre-incident state is, if anything, to her detriment. So her value actually increased, not decreased, because of this incident. Khan Bishainim Bakaris, whereas the other brides, where Shimon Gamliel seems to admit, seem to concede that there is a loss of value because of this incident, is because it's not her first child. And therefore, you know, the, the sakana level is much, is much lower, it's diminished, and therefore, if anything, we say she had greater value before than afterwards. So in any case, according to Rishim Lil, it may be to the husband, but shvach is that's, you know, split between the husband and the wife. But according to Rabbanon, it all goes to the husband. Why? For Rabbanon, the Amri, shvach is nami, the whole that second payment also goes to my time, and why? Kedesnan, we have a Mishnah, a Raisa, Mimash, Mashinemar. Once the Pasuk tells us, she lost her unborn children. In the don't I really figure she heard that she was expectant? Matam, why does the Pasuk have to express it, her that she was expecting? Let me look to tell you, Shavach, Hiroyin, Nabal, any added value due to this pregnancy goes to the husband uh, only. Says the Gemara, Verab, and Shimgam Liel. Hi, Hara, my daughter space. What does he do with the extra word Hara? Mabayla Kilisani applies it to the following Allah. Well, that's the That this attacker is only liable for these payments if he uh, strikes her uh, at the location on her body where the, uh, where the um, you know, the uh, fetus is, is, uh, is positioned. Amra Papa Loi Tema Keneged Base Heroin Mamash doesn't mean Mamash just opposite that area. Elo Kalhecha the Salak Base Shich Malavlat. It means any type of you know striking of the Isha which would uh, generate danger. Would uh, Rashi says Shich means heat. So basically, it's gonna directly affect the unborn fetus. But La Fuki Yad Regal the Loi. Let's say strikes her on her hand or her foot. That's you know at a distance from this unborn child. We don't apply the Allah of the Mei Velodes, we don't, you know, hold them accountable. The Mishnah continues, but if there is no husband to speak of, let's say he was a ger who died, then there's no payment issued. Haisa shifcho, nishtachro, eigir is pat amarabo. But remember, Leishon, that's only said, Ela shachavo v'bachaya ger. Who means a ger? The attack took place during her husband, the ger's lifetime, and now he died without any family. The kivan to chaval ba b'chayyager, zochal b'ger. Since this fellow attacked the wife during the ger's lifetime, so the ger acquires that zochus. The kivan the meis ha'ger. Now that the ger passed on. Who gets it? Who's the closest to the pot? The person who was meant to pay and didn't pay it. Zochal b'min boom and ha'ger. So he's zayich and he keeps the money. Avol chaval ba b'lachar misas ha'ger. But let's say, says Rabbi, let's say. Her husband, the Ger, had already passed on, and now the attack took place when she was single. She was a widow. In this case, he doesn't get anything. He has to pay. He has to pay it out to to the wife, to the Isha, because once the Ger passes on, she it's like she's Zecha in the unborn children, and now she has a right to collect any liabilities resulting from any incident revolving this, these children. So she was Zeich the children from her husband. Amr of Chizda, disagrees. Mare Dichi, who is the master of this halacha? Who said this halacha? Pay close attention. How does this work? Atu Vladis, it's Do you mean that unborn babies are like, you know, bundles of money that an Isha can be Zeich them from the husband? It doesn't work like that. They're not items and objects to pass on from one person to the other. Vizachi Bu, she's No. The terrorist stipulates, look, this incident occurs, tragedy strikes, you got to pay to the husband. Okay. If he's here, fine. If he's not, there's no payment. Ella, you say Labal, there's a husband to speak of. Zachal Rahmana. The terrorist grants him the right to collect this money. Let's say Labal, there's no husband to speak of. Fine, there's no payment. Lie. There's no such thing as transferring it to the Isha. So Rabba says yes. Rav Chizah says no. Mace, we're going to have a kasha on Rabba who says that if there's no husband to speak of during the attack, the Isha was and she gets the payment. Meisve, he gets the Isha. 
So this fellow attacks the Isha, she loses her uh, children. Noisin Nezek Vitsar Isha. So actual damages, like we explained before, that's a separate issue. That goes to the Isha and Tsar, pain as well. Ud Mevilodis Labal. The Mevilodis goes to the husband. Eina Baal, let's say there's no husband. Noisin Liyasha, it gets passed on to his family. Eina Isha. And in terms of the Nezek Vitsar, which is given to the Isha, if there's no Isha, it goes to her family. Noisin Liyarashia. Hoysa Shivcham Nishtakra, Agir Sacha, let's say there's no. Uh, Yerushim, because uh, your husband was a ger, or was a, was a evid, it was free. So the fellow who was meant to pay, no longer pays. Apparently, the Isha is not zaych on these payments, despite the fact that there's no husband to speak of. That's a Kashan Rabbah, who says, if there's no Isha, no man, it goes to the, husband, to the Isha. Amri said, the answer that was given was like this. Umi adifa mi masnisen, why is this price any better than the Mishnah? We already explained that the mission is like this. The Ukimna we already established The mission which says that you don't pay, that's because the attack took place when the ger was around. So he was Zoycha and that potential payout, and now that he passed on, there's nobody to take it. So the payer, you know, saves his payment. He's Zoycha. That's the case of the mission. We're not speaking that it happened after he passed on, it happened during his lifetime. And there everybody agrees. He was really zeich in that potential payout. And when he passes on, the, the attacker keeps his money. Yachanam, he was on the bride. So we're speaking about that very case. He attacked her during the ger's lifetime, and then he died. So now, the, man, the, the, the attacker keeps his money. He buys the same, or you can say, True. The attack took place after the husband died. So why doesn't she get the money? Let's explain it. The bride really means... Zachsa, that um, who's Zaycha? The one who's meant to be Zaycha. Right? Rises says Zach, who? The one who's meant to be Zaycha, meaning the one who has a right to collect that money. In this case, it's the Isha, the Grabo. Okay, so bottom line, we have a Machlekes Amorayim. An Isha who's a widow, who was attacked. Is there any payout or not? According to Rabba, there's maybe a this to the Isha. According to Rav Chizda, no. It's only meant for the husband. Perhaps this question is really a machlekes tanoim. The Bryson says, Bas Yisrael, Shunisus Liger. And it's Abraham and Menem. A regular Bas Yisrael married a ger. She became pregnant. Somebody attacked her during his lifetime. No, he said, Maybe this Liger. Okay, so he pays the ger. But if the attack took place after the ger passed on, that's when he attacked. We have two shites, two opinions. Tani Chada Chayev. One Tana says you have to pay, one says you don't. My love, Tana Yinu. Apparently, this is the uh, Shaila here. Whether an attack which occurs after the Ger is passing, whether that entitles the Isha to uh, accept payment for the Vlades. The Rabba Vade Tana Now, according to Rabba, there's no question it's a Machlekes Tana His opinion, Rabba's opinion, that there is payout, follows the Shita which says Chayav. But the sheet that says Potter is in disagreement. There's no question about that. But according to the Chiz's approach, do we really have to say it's a Machlekes Tanoim or is, is there perhaps another uh, way out? Milei Metanoi says, well, you know what? Let's try to figure something out. Oh. According to the Chiz, you can say that all agree that when it comes to Dmei Valades, remember we had those you know, two parts, two components within Dmei Valades. Value of the actual unborn children, where a person to, you know, decide to purchase them if they were you know, potential slaves. Then we have Shavach Valades, the added value to the, to the mother, to the Isha, due to this pregnancy, right? So we explained before that according to Rabbanon, all this goes to the husband. So now the Brisa here, which speaks about this fellow who attacked the Isha after her husband's passing, there's no payout, that's the Rabbanon, because they hold that all these payments, both components of the Mevelah, just go to the husband. There's no husband, he's bought. Oh, but the Brisa, which says that there is payout to the Isha, we're not speaking about the first component. Mevelah, that's exclusively to the husband. It's not Shvach, which according to Shem Malil, is meant to be split evenly between the Isha and the husband. Okay, that makes sense. So there's no husband, it still goes to the Isha, because she always had a right in them. She was had a right to collect at least part of it. So this can perfectly work according to Rav Chizda. 
He speaks about the Mabel of this. According to Rabbonon. But he was speaking about the Shemuliel, which is entitled to some payout, irrespective of whether her husband is alive or not. Well, on that, the Gemara now pounces and says, one second, going to go into that Shita, my Yeri Lacha Misa. So why present uh, this halacha in the context of, of a husband who died? I feel Machayim Nami Isla Palga. Well, even during his lifetime, Kodem Shim Gamliel, she gets 50%. You're right, Machayim Isla Palga. During his lifetime, she gets 50%. Lacha Misa Kule, but now that he died, she gets, she gets everything. And that's what the Bryce is highlighting. By saying another pshat in the Bryce it can be. Hava ha, both Bryces. The one that says Chayev, the one that says Potter, are both following the Shita of Rabbi Shim Gamliel. Kambash Shvach Valadis, Kambad Mei Valadis. When it comes to Dmei Valadis, that first component, it only goes to the husband. There's no husband, there's no payment. Shvach Valadis, okay, that's the second Bryce, which says you have to pay. Shvach Valadis, okay, that goes to the Isha. So whether he's around or not, it goes to the Isha. Well, says the Gemara, Amri, so the question is like this. You're telling me that there's no husband, Shvach will let this go to the Isha, but realize that there was a major change here. There was a major upgrade. During his lifetime, of course she gets Shvach will let that second component, but only 50% of it. Now you're telling me she gets 100%. Amri, Shvach will let this, from the fact that we grant her the entire Shvach Valadis, that's a change of status, that's an upgrade. Lishma Dmei Valadis. That should perhaps be an indication to us that even when it comes to that first component of payment, Dmei Valadis, if the attack occurs after the Ger is passing, it also goes to the Isha. Just like she gets, she suddenly got a greater share of the Shvach Valadis, apparently some change occurs, she sort of, you know, took over the, the you know, the rice to collect these payments, so she gets the Dmei Valadis as well. That's number one. Umid the Rav Shimon Gamliel, and from the fact that according to Rav Shimon Gamliel, she gets more shmach v'lodis than she did during her husband's lifetime. Lishma the Rabbanon. That perhaps indicates to us that even the Rabbanon would agree that that you know during sure during his lifetime she doesn't get anything, but after his passing she steps right in there. Basically, there's no machlokes between the two, between Rabbanon and you know Rishon Lil in terms of how do we deal with this whole incident after, you know, if it occurs after her husband's passing. They're only discussing, you know, what happens during the husband's lifetime. Rabbanon says he gets everything. Rishon Lil says she gets part of the shachulodis. But here, apparently, some change, some transformation occurs because we see that the equation totally changes. Fine. I understand, it's from Shulam Lil speaking, but something changed. Until now she only got 50%, now she's getting full. So apparently something happened. Even according to Rabbana, something happened. And she gets more than she did before. That's a riot to, to, uh, to Rabba. She's entitled to some payout. So the says, no, 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 no. Amri. So the response given was like this. Loy. No, don't compare the two things. Although we say that despite the fact that the Isha was only entitled to 50% of Shvach Valadis during her husband's lifetime. But now that he passed on, now that the incident occurred after he wasn't, he was no longer alive, she gets 100%. You know why? Because she already had some sort of foothold. She already had some sort of zechus in Shvach Valadis. She had 50%, so now she gets the whole thing. Look, Shvach Valadis is Shaycha Yodah Begav Bayu. She already had her, her hand in it. She already had entitlement at least partially, so now that, you know, the husband is not a factor, she gets everything. But the Mei Valadis, that first component, the Mei Valadis, that she never had any entitlement, uh, you know, to collect. So in this, in this, she has no zechus at all. Even if there's no husband, she doesn't get it. So basically, both prices can certainly be going like, like Rav Chiz's approach that there's no concept of pay out to the Isha, even if the attack occurred when there's no husband around. The only reason why the Brysa says there is some sort of payout, that's going on that second component, Shvach Valadis, which really, according to Lil, she was entitled to some sort of payout during his lifetime as well, so now she gets the whole thing. Because she has no, you know, nobody to share it with, so to speak. She has no partner. So, yeah, that makes sense, but otherwise, the Dmei Valadis, or anything that would have been just the husband's, um, you know, the attacker is exempt from paying at this point. So bottom line is, 
a fellow attacks an Isha, harms her unborn children, Torah says you pay the May Velades. According to the Rabbana, there are two parts. There is the May Velades, the actual you know, value of the unborn children, and then there's the Shvach Velades, the added you know, value to the Isha due to her state. Both go to the uh, husband. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel disagrees on both accounts. He says, "Look, I'm uh, Keres, first, you know, first uh, childbirth. If anything, she's more, she's more misukim beforehand than afterwards. She's in danger. So her, you can't say her value dropped. So he nixes that. Okay, if she's not her first. Uh, it's not her first, her first times. So then he agrees that there is a shvach of this as well. But he he, uh, he says we split it partially to the husband, partially to the um, to the isha, fifty fifty." Now, what happens if there's no husband? So, the mission says, uh, you know, if it goes to his family, or uh, if there's no family, it goes to the uh, person who's meant to pay, meaning he keeps the money. What happens if the attack occurred after her husband passed on? Okay, so according to uh, Rabba, she gets the uh, payout. According to Rav Chizda, nothing changes. But, even Rav Chizda would agree that the Shvach Valades, which according to Rosh Hashanah is always given partially to the Isha. In this case, she'll get it full, fully. Okay, on the topic of the possessions of a, of a Ger who passed on without any family, Boy Minei Rav Yeva Sabo, he has the question of Rav Nachman. We know that anybody can just grab, can take possession of the Ger's, you know, property because there's nobody there to claim it. So what happens if a person's Hamachzik B'Shtar Yosef Shal Ger Mau? Suppose the Ger lent somebody money, and he had a star which granted him, you know, a lien claim on somebody's properties, right? And now somebody else is in possession of that star when the Ger dies. Ma, what's the Allah? So he certainly is not going to get those, those properties because, if anything, the person who owns the properties is the first, you know, uh, to get it, right? It's closest to him. So forget about getting the properties. But what about um, <laughs> getting the paper? Rashi says, Mao Likno says on the Person who's in possession of this document. Did he have, you know, his mindset perhaps is, I want to take possession of that claim, of that lien. He's not thinking paper. Ma, what's the Allah? Man the Machsak Bashtara. When a person is in possession of a document, such as in this case, Adaiti the Aru the Machsak, he's really clutching it to get possession on the properties. Uba Aru Hale Achsak, but he didn't. He, he, he didn't, he's not getting possession of the properties. So forget about that. Ushtar and Amilek Kana. And certainly he's not trying to be kind of the paper, so he gets nothing. The live daiti ashtar, because he's not taking paper, right? So if somebody else grabs the paper, he can keep it. Or he did, or perhaps, daiti ami ashtar. You know what? At least let me get the paper. So uh, he's, you know, that, that's his mindset, and he's doing chazak on the paper, and he keeps it. Amalei, sir, of Nachum responded, Ani Mari, please respond to me, my master. Why would a person think paper? His fellow is trying to, you know, use this document to grant him ownership on the Empire State Building. He's going to watch to guard this document like the apple of his eye. He's not going to use it to, you know, uh, wrap his, uh, his, his jar. So that's not his mindset at all. He's not thinking paper. Amalei, lots of lots of no. Still, maybe, you know, he's thinking in terms of uh, using it as a piece of paper as well and he gets a schus to hold on to that. Amar Rabbo. Another Allah. Mashkeni shall Yisrael biad ger. So ger lent to Yisrael money, and he's holding on to a collateral. Umei the ger dies with any family. Uboi Yisrael achav echsek boy. Comes another person and grabs onto that collateral. We take it away from him. We give it back to the owner. My time, you know why? Given the mace, like ger, once the ger dies, pakali shibude. So his claim on that collateral expires. And who gets it? By default, it goes back to the owner. He's the first claimer. Nobody can take it. Mashkoyin shall ger be at Yisrael. Let's go the other way. Yisrael lent a ger money and is in possession of a, of a mashkin, of the ger. Umesa ger and the ger dies. Boy Yisrael, acha bechzik boy, comes another fellow and grabs the mashkin. Zekon, okay, like it So the, the Malva, the one who lent the money to the ger, he has a schus to hold on to at least part of the mashkin, which, which corresponds to the money that he lent to the Israel. 
because he was already in possession of that amount of the mashkin in lieu of payment, right? But this fellow grabbed it, he gets the rest. Asks the Gemara, why? Where is the mashkin sitting? In the Malva's house. We know that a person's, you know, property is for him. It's like a shliach. The Amar Abiz Rechanina, Chatzir Shal Adam, a person's yard, a person's chatzir, even if he's not totally in tune to what's going on. If it's sitting in my property, I'm kind of, nobody can take it. Amri said the answer given was like this. Hachab, my skin was speaking the lesse. The mob was not in town. And therefore, call hechadi, he said, the day if the person is around, the boy makni, which gives him the ability to access the item and to be kind of physically. So then the chatzir can act, you know, in lieu of the person, can represent the person, motzi kani. Sorry, if you would wish to be kind, he has the ability to do so. He's standing at kind of the so the chutzah can do the same for him. But the day, but if he's not around, he's not in town. The mikni. So if you would wish to be make a kini, a physical kini, he couldn't do it. He's not around. So therefore, the chutzah can't do the same, which is a chiddush. Vilchas of the more disagrees. The conclusion is the lesse be chutzir leikana. No. Something sitting in my chatzer and it's now half gram kind of regardless of whether I'm here or not. Rather, the case here must be speaking that the item is not sitting in my chatzer, it's sitting somewhere in the street. So, the only hole that I have is the part of it that corresponds to the loan that I issued to the gear. That much I own because I, I was kind of the mashkin in proportion to my loan. But the rest of it, anything left over, the fellow grabbed it, can be zaych. Continues the mission. A person digs a pit in his backyard, but he tunneled it into the street. So the opening is in the street, and that's where the hazard is. It's called a barbish sarabim. All the opposite. He dig up, dug a pit in the street, but it's not really open there. It's open in his backyard. Or the third case, he dug it in his backyard. And he, you know, he uh, stretched it into a different. Uh, and Rashi points out that he was mafker. He made it accessible to the public. So in all these cases, he presented a hazard, a dangerous obstacle. Is chayiv. Tana rabbam. Chayiv of Rishus Hayochid. Pesach Rishus Rabbam. Chayiv. So if he opens a pit to the street, even if he dug it in his private, you know, territory, is chayiv, because ultimately it's called the Bar Rishus Rabbam. Because as Rashi says, where's the takkala? Where's the uh, hazard. Where's the obstacle? Right? It's in the street. So it's chayef for any damages which ensue. This is the you know classic example of a boyer discussed in the Torah for which you're liable. No. No. When the Torah speaks about a boyer, we're speaking about a boyer which was dug in one's private possession, which he then made hefker. He opened the doors and allowed the public public to access it. That's the bar that is chayef for. I'm a rabbi. The machlekes isn't so, you know, vast. The bar versus rabbi. If it's a bar in the middle of the street that he dug, of course he's chayef. All agree. Kuliyam will be the machayef. Why? My time, I'm a crow. The Pasuk says. The Pasuk seems to repeat itself. Ki yiftach v'chayichra he opened up the lid of a bar, a pre-existing pit in the street, and then it says, V'chayichri dug. Why do you have to, Imal psicha chayev, once we say that you're simply responsible for opening a pit, for exposing a pit, of course for digging one, I'll create a koshkin, of course, needless to say, if you dig it from scratch, your chayev. Why? Right? Elo shal iski psicha val iski kriya boiloi. Pasuk saying, is bringing out a point. It's not because you own the pit. It's different than you know, your animal, your shark, you have to own your animal to be liable, right? For any damages. But he was speaking about a, a mass, an act. It's not because it's your possession. It's not because it's your property. It's because you presented a hazard. Al iski psich, al iski kriya Because of your association, because of your activity, because you caused a hazard. You opened a pit, you dug a pit. So, even if it's in the street, you're a chayef. Because you, it's a man-made obstacle. Even though it's not man-owned, but it's man-made. 
So all agree on that. What happens if it's a bar in your private procession? Okay, you dug a pit in your backyard, and then you open your gates. Anybody can come in. Rabbi Kiva saw a bar b'shus and amichayiv. In this case, you chayiv as well. The chassid of the pasuk says bala bar, bala bar yishalom, which sounds like you own it, even though it's yours. You have to pay for it. The bar disley bailam was speaking about a bar, which um, was owned by a person. The bar disley bailam bailam kamer achmona yichayiv. Small sovereign, no bala takol. If it's owned, if it's privately owned, it's not the bar that Torah holds you liable for. Bala bar just means the one who caused the hezek, who created the obstacle, who you know presented the the the, the hezek, but it's only if it's in the street. Okay, so according to Rabbi's approach, a bar versus Rab, all agree or chayiv. Bar versus Ayachad machlekes. Now Rabbi Kiva said that you should know. That the bar versus Ayachad, that's the bar that Torah spoke about. Why? Why did Rabbi Kiva have to sort of express himself like that? According to Rabba, um, even a Barbish says, Ram Yochayev, right? According to uh, all agree, or to all shittas. Elamai, so what's the point of saying, Zeu Boy Ramar Atayra, the Ka'amar Akiva, Rakiva, me when he said this, the one who says, Yachas, is the one. Zeu Bar Shet Pasach, by a cause of Tchilut Tashlumen. He says, say that when the terrorists, you know, the first time terrorists spoke about the Bala Bar paying, Bala Bar Yishalim, it was about this bar that is a man owned, it's owned by a man. Um, that's the bird that Tur discusses. Okay, so basically Rukiv is responding to Rishmo. How could you say that a person's potter for a bird that's sitting in his Rishus? If anything, that is the bird which the Tur refers to. The first time that it discusses liability, Balabar Yishalim, the bird is Lebailim, and of course Yuchayev. Okay, all the best to you, and Atzlacha